Hello and welcome to the world around us. Today we begin our travels in Las Vegas with a story on unionized maids. Will you love From there to England and, and the new phenomenon of freelance priests, so then to Australia and a look at how the backwoods get reported. From there to Boston and the problems of stressed I'm out children. And finally to Turkey and a story on camel fighting as a spectator sport. Mention Las Vegas and what you think of immediately are the bright lights of casinos and hotels that cater to the thousands who come to this gambling town to try their luck at the tables. But behind the bright lights is another story, a story of maids who keep these hotels and casinos running, but who generally stay in the background unseen and unheard. These women are now discovering their power, and they are expressing it through unions that have made them a force to reckon with. Let's take a look at Las Vegas behind the bright lights. Las Vegas, Nevada the gambling capital of the world. Over the past six years, there's been an explosion in Las Vegas. A population explosion. The growing appetite for gambling has made Las Vegas the fastest growing city in America. Tens of thousands of people have migrated here in recent years to build and to work in the scores of hotels and casinos that have gone up and are going up along the famous Vegas Strip. Okay, good morning, everyone. Please hold it down so people can hear their names. Thank you. Most end up at the local union hall, where they wait for a lead. I have flamingo. Do you want to go? Yes, ma'am. An opening for a cocktail waitress at Caesar's Palace. Want to try Luxor? Or a bellhop at Bally's. Porter. Good luck to you. With almost 100,000 hotel rooms in Vegas, there is plenty of maid work available. We always keep that cot here in the dough like this and if anybody come up you talk to them across the cot with the dough open. Hattie Canty began working as a maid 21 years ago. Back then the only training maids received was on the job. Today maids learn the tricks of the trade at a special school that prepares them to work in Vegas hotels. You get an A, okay? <laughs> Canty takes a particular interest in these students. Don't worry honey, you got what it takes to make it. She's okay. now the president of Local 226 of the Culinary Workers Union, which runs the training school. And there's a lot of good employers out there, okay? And you're going to get a good job, you're going to do well. The training school is Canty's pride and joy, a chance to help women get off welfare and into the workforce. It's a choice Canty had 21 years ago after her husband died, leaving her with eight children to support. After he died, I had a big decision to make, and that decision was... Am I going to be able to go out and cope in the work world? Uh, would I be a better mother if I sit home and I wait on welfare? And I made up my mind that I would go out and get, get me a job. A union job that paid twice as much as welfare and came with a pension and health insurance. Hey, sir, you yet a scab. You yet a scab for going up in that scab joint. Canty has gone from making beds to making trouble for hotel and casino owners in Vegas. Strike here, folks. Once you go somewhere else, please pass it on by. Pass it on by, ma'am. Vegas is a union town. Hattie Canty's local alone has almost 40,000 members, making it the largest private sector local in the country. And when it needs to, Local 226 flexes its muscles. Thousands of union members virtually shut down the Las Vegas Strip in a massive demonstration against the Frontier Hotel. The Frontier strike has been going on for almost five years now, the longest running strike in the country. Union buses gotta go, hey, hey. Every so often, Hattie Canty will pick up a sign and walk the picket line. She is a perfect scab. I'm talking to you. Hey, I'm talking to you. The front kept been on strike for over five years, and you didn't know? No, I went in that door. I just got into down, love. Well, you went, you was in there for a while, and you know, these people out here fighting for their health and welfare, and for their pension, their wages, and this company right here, you are with me, and you got a, a frontier cup of change, you are with me. But don't come back. Don't come back. You are not welcome in this town. Go back to wherever you came from. You're a perfect example of a scale. When it comes to getting their message out, the owners of the Frontier are no match for Hattie Candy in Local 226. This hotel is open to break the union. 
And as the strike has dragged on, Frontier Management has declined requests for interview. Give your hard earned money to Patty Canty's union militancy is rooted firmly in the civil rights movement. Born and raised in racially divided rural Alabama, she arrived in Las Vegas in the early 60s, just as segregation ended on the Strip. Today, the demands may be different, but the tactics are the same. When you take a position like this, then there are going to come a time when you will be arrested. Those are hand grenades or uh, M14s. Uh -huh. They've got a lot of union power, that's it. <laughs> Patty Canty is the first woman to serve as a top officer of the Culinary Workers Union. All people, all colors, all of us in this together. But as an African American woman, President Canty has had to fight for respect within organized labor. If there's a meeting going on, my place is to be there too. If I'm not invited, it's still my place to be there. I always make my way there. If the door is locked, I knock on the door and I go in. I've had to take seats, and I mean literally, take my seat at head tables in the AFL CIO. And I'm not a vicious person, I'm not a mean person, but I am one who will assert myself if I have to. It's this determination that's made Hattie Canty a role model for Vegas maids like Yolanda Bonner Aldridge. It gives you hope to see that you can climb and go somewhere too. You don't have to just stay right there where you are. You can make it too. Bonner Aldridge works at the Luxor Hotel where she makes about ten dollars an hour. In Vegas, union maids are middle class. I got me a 95 car. I'm buying, getting ready to buy a home. I think I'm doing very well. Hattie Canty was able to hold on to her house and help put six of her children through college on a maid salary. I guess everybody wants a piece of the American dream, and I'm very proud of what I have achieved here. If anybody had told me I was going to be the president of the Culinary Union when I was like 18 years old, I would, that, that was just, I couldn't even conceive that. It's very important that you stick together as one. Now, her mission is to help others achieve their dreams, or at the very least, a living wage and a degree of dignity. Maids have always been kept in the back of the house, but through me, I'm bringing them out to the front of the house. Maids will never be looked on anymore as people that's supposed to be in the back of the house. It's graduation day for the women who completed their training at the maid school. Today, I yet call myself a maid. Union president and union maid, Hattie Canty, gives the commencement address. I'm really proud of the work I did out there in those hotels as a maid. I'm happy with Hattie. Hattie have did great things out there, and I'm a little country girl from Alabama. I believe in this union. I don't have a husband. My baby's 27 years old, and this is my thing now. This is my family. This is my life, and I'm going to give it all I got. Freelancing is something that you would not usually associate with priests. You would imagine that they would need a church to perform their various duties to the community. But the needs of modern times are strange, as we see in this story from Central England, where nearly a dozen Church of England vicars have opted for freelancing to perform weddings and baptisms. The Reverend Sturge Artis is an uncommon kind of vicar, and not just because he polishes his own ceremonial brass. Unlike his colleagues, he has no church, and his parish is a movable feast. He goes where the customers are. When duty calls, Artis packs up his portable altar and processional cross and sets off to minister. He's one of about a dozen Church of England vicars who've waved goodbye to the Anglican establishment and opted for the freelance life. I suddenly discovered that the, the demand for the kind of work that I was uh, proposing to do was absolutely amazing, and I was just showered with requests. Although this is serious business, some of the requests can be pretty bizarre. 
In the bar of a social club in central England, as the beer flows freely, artist prepares to conduct the wedding of a couple nostalgic for the ways of the old Wild West. Rattlesnake Annie, will you take this man to be your lawful wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of marriage? Will you love him, honour and keep him, and forsaking all others be faithful to him so long as you both shall live? I will. So were you happy with the way things turned out? I was overjoyed. It was excellent. The service was brilliant, and our friends and that, which we call family, because we are like a family here, aren't we, love? For the vicar, that kind of verdict makes it all worthwhile. The local bishop has been uh, opposed to me in every possible way he can writing to all the undertakers, telling them to boycott my, uh, my uh, services and uh, denigrating me in the press, saying that I'm blackening the good name of the church. Uh, that was when I'd uh, done a baptism in a pub. And uh, I reminded, the, the, through the press, I reminded them that Jesus was born in the stable of a pub. And if it hadn't been full, he'd have been born right inside the pub. And if it's good enough for his birth, surely it's good enough for a baptism. But it isn't just pubs the church disapproves of. This open-air baptism in a suburban garden in London also breaks the rules. That doesn't bother vicar Jonathan Blake, however. He was the first to set up a mobile ministry in 1984. He firmly believes that churches and worship don't have to go together. He's even conducted a wedding on the internet. Alexander Cameron, I baptize you. The church says that, oh, there's lots of people who are not Christians in this country. I think quite the opposite. People have got a living faith, a deep respect and allegiance to Christianity, but they don't like the way the church packages worship services or ministry. And what I'm trying to do is to offer something that's spontaneous and flexible and realistic for them in today's age. And I think that's exactly what Jesus and the early church did. Why did you decide to do it this way? I think because we were only impressed with our eldest son's christening, um, which was a traditional service in church. Very dark, very gloomy, rather like a conveyor belt system. It was actually, yeah. Uh, which we shared with about awful. four other families. Uh, not very personal, not very happy occasion, really. Very gloomy. The established church's loss is the freelance vicar's gain. And while pews remain half empty, Rebels like Sturge artists revel in their new way of life. I feel much freer now, and I don't have to worry what an old bishop will say or a, a neighbouring priest. I can just go and do it and uh, rejoice at the happiness of the people as a result. For the freelance vicars and their eager congregations, there's no turning back. This is Vera Frankel in London. <laughs> The Australian outback is a vast hinterland which remains a mystery to even most Australians since 80% of them live in cities. In our next story, we see how one adventurous journalist makes a living out of reporting the outback for Australia's television networks. The Australians call the Northern Territory Never Never Land. Surrounded on all sides by thousands of miles of desert, Alice Springs is the only city in the region. It was here that Erwin Schlanda, an Australian journalist, arrived 20 years ago in search of space and adventure. He is the only regular correspondent that Australia's four television networks have working for them in the outback. At some 80% of Australians live in the big cities. Uh, they have absolutely no idea what goes on in the outback. And I'm privileged and we are privileged to bring some of the topics that are so important and so interesting and so fascinating from this region into the cities, which are so similar to Europe and America. Because he covers a vast area, Irwin flies from one story to another. Often he spends six hours a day in his plane, sometimes filming at the same time he's piloting the plane. Today, Irwin is going to an Aborigine reservation in the middle of the Tanami Desert. 
the 800 inhabitants here are virtually cut off from the outside world. But recently, the government installed a satellite dish that now makes it possible for Aborigine school children to attend class. Irwin's story will be about the advantages and disadvantages of this technological feat. Does anyone not get zeros? It's essential that they must have someone there to supervise them, uh, to, to sort of transmit those things that I've just alluded to, that as a teacher in a classroom, I would be able to pick up myself, but um, on, on a camera, it's very difficult to pick up. Irwin produces his films at home. Over the years, he has installed his own makeshift facilities. The improvising part of the game in the bush, as you can see, this is the, the kitchen for the family and the kitchen for the crew. And over here is the pantry. And the pantry also doubles as the sound booth. You walk in, put your script here, put your microphone there, make sure the glasses are arranged properly, egg cartons in place to dampen the sound, uh, shut the door, and you read, this, you read your stuff. We're recorded in there. Costs nothing, looks like a charm. Fantastic. Irwin's wife, Karen, helps him edit the films. Sometimes it's hard being uh, his wife, and uh, for our children it's, it's hard because they don't see enough of him, and we don't have a regular family life. Sometimes he's here, sometimes he's away. But on the other hand, he's able to offer the children some very special experiences. As often as we can, we take them with us on our work and they've uh, met a lot of people and done a lot of things that most children wouldn't be able to do. Life really is great because there's a lot of space. Um, people are not sitting on top of each other. So if you like people, you, you keep that company. If you don't like people, you're kind of uh, space to get away from them. I think this is what makes life great. There's a lot of personal freedom. They do things their own way in the Northern Territory. To raise money for charity, Alice Springs residents put on an annual boat race. But because the river runs dry here almost all year, it's a bottomless boat race. <laughs> Irwin's films have helped popularize the event, which now draw participants and spectators from all over Australia. This year, a storm blew up the night before the race. By morning, the river had flooded. The regatta was canceled for the first time in its history because there was actually water in the river. The organizers were upset, but Irwin was delighted. Well, it's a good story for me, yeah. It's a funny story, you know, because we've, for the last 19 years, I think, I've shot the Henley on Todd as it is meant to be, you know, the dry regatta. But this year, of course, the story is that it's not taking place. So. Transmitting the footage 3,000 miles away to Sydney requires some ingenuity. Irwin uses his car battery to get the video recorder to work. He hooks up his equipment by cable to the Alice Springs transmitting station. He will fax his script on his portable computer. Thanks a lot. That evening, Irwin's story is shown on all four networks. Irwin never sees his work broadcast. He's too far away to pick up the channels he works for. It's his only regret. He wouldn't change his job for the world. In India, we've recently seen a spate of tragic suicides by young children who've been unable to cope with the stress of examinations and schoolwork. The kind of stress is a global phenomenon and gets worse in developed countries like America, where competition is the essence of everything. Ironically, since we have our own problems, American schools are turning to an ancient Indian method, meditation, to relieve stress in school-going children. I want to invite you to get a picture of a lake 
in your mind's eye. Its first period at Dennis Yarmouth High School and a group of ninth graders begins to meditate. You wouldn't you think that kids that would need to be taught how to relax and act like green. kids, but for these 14-year-olds like Abby Seaman, the stress of their daily routine is overwhelming. Because there's like 20 different people asking and wanting and like demanding so much from me, like teachers and parents. Instructor Bernice Tedros. We have a culture um, that's very driven. We have to accomplish. And that's what these kids are feeling, these tremendous pressures. For seven-year-old Kate Sullivan, meditation classes may still be a few years off, but she's already feeling the pressures of yeah, having too much to, to do. Kate is used to doing several things at mm -hmm. once and getting a hand from her parents, Wilma and Philip. It's the only way she can cram in school and her seven favorite activities, which keep her busy every afternoon. <laughs> She'll play two full games before moving on. There are just a few minutes to scrub off the soccer field and complete the transformation from sweaty soccer star to stunning ice princess. Kate's weekly routine also includes track, gymnastics, and ballet. There you go. She gives her a lot of confidence. She can do anything. She's not afraid to participate in any sport, really. You know, if she wants to do it, she can do it. If not, she doesn't have to. I do. You, you do? do. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that seven-year-olds know exactly what they want. <laughs> Certainly older kids and, and adolescents can make these decisions. And I think the parents have to decide, look, you have to give something up. You choose which one, but you have to give something. It's just too much. So it grows out of good intentions, wanting to give children the best possible opportunity to you know, compete in this highly competitive world today, but at the same time, it takes its toll of children. In adolescence, we see you know, other reactions, uh, substance abuse, and for example, cigarette usage in young women has increased substantially. I see that as a direct reaction to the stress of or early pressures for sexual activity and other things on young women which weren't there before. One more time, real small, let it out. In order to prevent such problems, experts say what kids really need to do is lighten their load. I'm not saying we shouldn't have high expectations for children, please understand, but sometimes the expectations have to be within reason and give children an opportunity to be children. In Boston, this is Tovia Smith reporting. Finally, to the ancient town of Ephesus in Turkey, where camels are more than beasts of burden, they are prize fighters. These camels are specially bred for this strange sport, which thousands come to watch. Fakir trains camels in Turkey. Most camels here are beasts of burden, but Fakir's animals are the elite. They are bred and trained for fighting. <laughs> Go on, my son Murad. You will fight on Sunday. You must win, and then afterward, I will give you many lovely things. Bakir makes his living this way. But camel training is more than a job. It's a matter of family pride and tradition. I learned to look after camels from my father and my grandfather. It's my inheritance from them. Living with camels, you come to know very well what they need. It's like your doctor. You can see what's wrong right away. Bakir's prize camel is nearly ready for a big fight. Preparations are meticulous. The 150-pound harness must fit the camel precisely. Spectacular embroidery is chosen, with mirrors to reflect the rays of the sun and to catch the eyes of spectators. At the last minute, a charm is added. This is to guard against bad luck. We put it on when they train or fight. Once they come back to the stable, we take it off.
Bekir is now en route to a prestigious camel fight in the ancient city of Ephesus. Ephesus celebrates for three days before the fight. Bekir and other camel trainers parade their animals through the streets. The crowds watch and try to guess which camel will win. Officially, there is no betting. The camel trainers only hope for the honor of winning. The biggest party takes place the night before the fights. In the morning, Bekir arrives at the ancient arena. Today's contest will draw more than 20,000. Forty fights take place. Each one will last for 10 minutes. The aim? to humiliate the adversary by bringing him to his knees. Bekir's camel has won. We prepared for this for a month. Out of my three camels, one lost and two won. I'm very happy. That's a good result. If we continue like this, Next year, we'll win everything. This year, for the first time, Bakir's son led their prize camel into combat. Bakir is proud and pleased. Tradition is being passed from one generation to the next. <laughs> That's all this week. Do join us next week, same time, same place, for another trip around the world around us. Thank you.